morning, everybody. Morning, Tom. Am I on? Okay. I can hear myself. Well, we're finally here. The holiday season. And the Lord turned the switch off on that warm weather and brought us the weather for the season. So let's enjoy it. <laughs> I'm trying my best to enjoy it. Anyway, I'm honored to be speaking with you today and sharing the word of the Lord with you today. I love Thanksgiving and I love Christmas. In our love for Christmas, we tend to jump over Thanksgiving. So it's good today to take time to just dwell intentionally upon Thanksgiving, the day and what it's all about, and what it should mean and what we make of it. And I've got a special treat for you today. I come across this old picture. It's a rendition of the original Thanksgiving feast of the pilgrims and the savages together. Could we bring that up on the screen? I don't know which one are the savages. That's all my family. And it's amazing that there was that many together one time for this Thanksgiving years ago. Um, there's still one family missing out of there. If any of you have a family get together for Thanksgiving with a picture of more people than that, I'd love to see that. I'd love to, I didn't realize there's that many people in my family. The, the one couple there to the right, kind of in the center with a little baby looking at my dad, those are ancestors of mine. Isn't that <laughs> uncanny resemblance? Anyway, that's what Thanksgiving reminds me of. Families getting together. Whether you like your family or not, we still get together for Thanksgiving. And it's a day set aside just for one thing. Giving thanks for what we have. Our countries, our family. Well, you can take that picture down, please. Thanks. <laughs> Our families are what make us. And we get to live in a country where we get to gather and celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm thankful that I live in the greatest country on this earth, that God has blessed us so incredibly, and that we have a force of men and women protecting us. So thank you, veterans, for doing that and keeping us where we're at. We also live in a country where we get to transfer power peacefully. There are people that oppose it. That's what's going to happen in a free society like this. But there's no wars going on because power has been passed along. It's just awesome. And thank you, Lord, for giving us that system. Think about it. I, and I'm speaking from my own personal perspective, but this is for all of us. I'm speaking as first time here, but I'm speaking for all of us. I was born in this country. I didn't choose to be born here. I was blessed to be born here in this country. Man, what if I was born in Vietnam or Cambodia? I, I can't even imagine that. So just that alone that I was born here without my choice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But I am so grateful for my family. I'm so thankful for my wife, my kids, my home, my job. And man, I am so thankful that I get to speak the word of the Lord in public. I have a captive audience. Most of you won't run out. Thank you. There is another side of Thanksgiving. There's the ugly side. I'll share one story with you. Uh, if any of you have participated in Black Friday, I never did. Didn't want any part of it. My wife and her cousin used to go out. I, I was asleep, and they'd be out. But one year, she had surgery, and so she couldn't get out, go out. And I graciously agreed to go out and do what I could. You've heard of the lamb going into the slaughter. 
I don't like Walmart anymore. I parked out at this place in Walmart where the, the Nintendo DS games were. I was going to get a DS game, incredible price. So I was right in that section where the DS games were. I staked my place. No one was going to move me. The sale started. Everyone went nuts. The games weren't there that I was looking for. Who didn't tell me that they're not in the departments where they're supposed to be? They're out in aisles and big bins. Panic set in. Where is this at? So I, I figured I'd ask some people who were willing to talk. They pointed clear over on the other side of the store. And so I went moving. And you've got to imagine this sea of humanity. There's no aisles. There's only people. And you've you got to get rough. And so I was working my way through, and I'm, I'm as... as as honest as I'm standing here, one woman got up on a cart to get over it, jumped over the cart and got in the crowd and kept moving. Didn't care who she landed on or what she was doing. Over a cart. I never, ever wanted to do Black Friday again. That's insane. Well, that's the world's view of Thanksgiving. But what I'd like to share with you today is the spiritual side of Thanksgiving. You know, when we do gather together as families, we've got oh, the yams, the pumpkin pies, all that good stuff. But we got to do, we got to say a prayer before we do our meal. You know, that's something that you have to do. For families that don't have a close relationship with Jesus, they still understand that you got to say a prayer to God. I mean, he's the one that did it all, or so I've heard. So you do your prayer before the meal, and you feel good about it, and you move on. You eat, and then you shop, and that's the gist of it. But there's the whole purpose of Thanksgiving. For me, and for you, and you know who you are, I've been given a second chance. We're going to spend today in Romans and the book of John. So if you would, open your Bibles, and the scriptures are listed in your program. We're going to start out with Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and oh, we'll start at verse 9. Go to verse 18. While you're getting there, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you, Lord, for this incredible honor to be a vessel, to be used of you this morning, to share your word with those around me. God, I pray that everything that comes out of my mouth is from you and for your glory and nothing else. God, may we leave here today with just a better understanding of a second chance that you have given us. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, is everybody there? Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18. Again, I'm speaking from a personal experience, and I know that I'm speaking for a lot of you, so this is for all of us. And the Apostle Paul is speaking about the Jewish people here. He says in verse 9, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, listen to this, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Their throats are open prayers. I'm sorry. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. 
man, that was written about me. Was it written about you? By the way, if you think I am the only one that this was written for, look at verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. The world does not seek God. I didn't seek God. Did one day you wake up and decide, I'm going to find God? Or did it take some calamity? Did it take some horrible event in your lives? Did it take you getting to the bottom of the pit where you could only look up? Did it take someone teaching you the word? Did it take someone standing up front going on and on and on and finally sinks in? No one seeks God. No one. And we're going to talk about something later on that's just incredible concerning that. Well, according to Romans 6.23, there's a result of doing all this stuff that we just read about. There's the result of that. You see, there's a payment that needs done for the sin that we commit. God is holy and righteous. As Carol told us, read to us up there, He is holy, holy, holy. There's no getting around the fact that He is sinless, He abhors sin, and anyone that sins is an enemy of His. The Bible says that sinners are enemies of God. How in the world could I ever be in the presence of my Lord how could I ever have blessing from him when I'm his enemy? If not for a second chance. You see, sin needs paid for. Since God is holy and righteous and keeps to his word, he doesn't forget sin that is unatoned for. He doesn't forget sin that is paid for. And folks, there's no uh, gray area about this. The wages of sin is death. Sometimes our sin does cause death. What we're talking about here is spiritual death. Complete separation from God. Complete darkness. God is light. In our sinfulness, we weren't in the light. We didn't know about the light. We didn't care about the light. The darkness fit us good. Because we could hide in that darkness could hide in that darkness. Folks, there was a time in my life where I was in that complete darkness. I knew about God, and I shared with you before, it was thank you for sending Billy Graham onto this earth, Lord, and his TV ministry, because it was during a TV telecast when I was like, 10 or 12 years old. I was in the living room by myself watching Billy Graham out of habit. But that night, when he made that invitation to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, as a little boy, I said yes, because I knew I needed him. I knew I needed Jesus because Billy convinced me. And it wasn't Billy. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through Billy. He convinced me that I needed Christ. So I, brought, I asked him to come into my life. Well, after that, I didn't tell anybody about it. I was too embarrassed. I mean, come on. And so I just went around my life. I lived as a pagan who asked Jesus into his life. God gave me a second chance. He gave me a second chance. The world says that we deserve a second chance. You know, if our finances are bad and we can't afford our home, we deserve to have a second chance. We deserve... We deserve to throw away our debt and start over again to have it forgiven. We don't deserve anything. That's where we fall into troubles when the world tells us we deserve this, we deserve that. You deserve that great car, that great house, that great spouse. You deserve everything. Ah, that's the biggest lie that Satan throws at us. 
We don't deserve anything because of what we have done. We are enemies of God in our sinfulness. We don't deserve anything. The one thing we do deserve is death. But despite that, let's go to Romans chapter 5. And let's start at verse 6. Romans is a good book. It's a good book. Romans chapter 5, verses 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What is the right time? Throughout creation, throughout the creation of humanity, us, when God created us, that started this collision course. The wrath of God, the holy, right wrath of God, was on a course to annihilate us. Because we were enemies of God, we sinned against Him. We deserved it. But on the other hand, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God was heading towards us too. Not by accident, all by design. So on this one Friday afternoon, the love of God met the wrath of God. And it was good. It was an ugly scene that day. Oh man, was that beautiful. God took care of it all, despite us. Despite who we are, who we were. In our, our hatred towards God, He took care of it for us. It's so awesome, that second chance. That was the right time in God's plan. He had it all planned out since be before time began. It says Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. I'm going to pick on somebody today. And I choose Dan. Dan is a good guy. Wouldn't we all agree? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, people. Help me out here. <laughs> Dan is a good guy. So, you're walking down the highway with Dan and Adolf Hitler. Why you're together, I don't know. A truck's barreling down the highway. is going to take you all out. Who would you try to push out of the way to save? Come on! I need a better example. <laughs> now wait a minute. You automatically say, well, I'll push Dan out of the way. Well, what, what about your life? Now, if I'm thinking about my life, I've got, let's see, I've got a wife I love, a family I love. If I get killed, I leave them behind. What a, hmm. Dan, I love you, but I don't know if I could do that. So you might give your life for a good and righteous man. But would you for... You would for Dan, maybe. But would you for Adolf Hitler? Would you for Osama bin Laden? Would you give your life for a drug dealer that's bringing death to untold numbers of people? Would you shove a child molester out of the way so that they would be spared and your life would be taken. I, I don't think I would. No, I like my life too much. But Jesus, look here. Verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all the drug dealers. Christ died for all of the molesters. Christ died for the murders. Christ died for bin Laden. He even died for me. 
I'm no better than anybody else. He died for all of us. And that, I, if you put yourself in that concept, who would you die for? Someone that hates you? Would you die for somebody that hates you? And that's what just, it's so hard to understand and accept sometimes that Christ died for me. Number one, I didn't ask him to. Secondly, I was his enemy. But he died for me. And he died for you. I'm so thankful for a second chance. Okay, here's where it gets kind of strange and I don't understand completely. God chose to open my ears to hear his voice. Would you go with me over to the book of John? And we'll, we'll finish out here in John. John 6, 44. John chapter 6, verse 44. Whenever I think about this, it gets me, spiritually, it gets me um, soft, gets me on my knees, it gets me emotionally. Why did I hear God's voice? Look at this. Are you all there? John chapter 6, verse 44. And this is Jesus speaking. I know it is because it's in red letters. He said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent Jesus draws us to him. Again, it's not on our, our own initiative that we make that search for God because we are of the sinful nature of the world where God maybe has a place in our, in our lives, just somewhere out there. We know there's a God because the heavens declares it. But we don't go looking for him. Our lives are just fine. We've got things we want. Things are going great. But yet, God spoke to my heart. He's, you know, there's some people that believe that God only preordains who will hear him and be saved based on Scripture. Uh, John, what's John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. The world. That, it doesn't say, for God so loved Brian, with a Y, <laughs> that he gave his son for me that, so that I could have eternal life. And no, it's just not me. The world. Us. People. If all of us have sinned, if all of us were condemned, then why wouldn't we all have a chance to be saved. I'm just asking. If all of us are condemned to die because of our sin, why would only a select few of us be allowed to hear His voice? God knows who's going to hear His voice. God knows who's going to hear His voice. Why did God give us free will to sin if He didn't give us free will to choose Him? Why do we have the choice to sin if we don't have the choice to live? The thing that I don't understand, and help me out, is only certain people answer. Only certain people answer His call. In Revelation, it says Jesus knocks at the door and if we answer, he'll, let it, when he'll come in. Now, he's speaking to that church in Revelation, but that's also to individuals. God in his small, still, quiet voice, our large, infinite God, won't force us to hear him or to answer and say yes to him. He won't force it. That, that completely goes against everything he is. He wants us to choose to love him. But why, why did I hear him say, Brian, 
come to me so you can live. Why? Why don't everybody hear that? Why isn't everybody given that chance? Maybe they are given that chance, but their heart just won't hear it. And I, I, I can't explain that. I can't explain that. Why my heart was allowed to be open to hear his voice and say yes, but yet my neighbor down the road, despite all the things they've heard about Jesus, all the things they've heard about God, all the declaration in the heavens of the creation that there is a God, why my neighbor down the road won't say yes. I don't understand that. But I am so thankful for that. That's what it's all about. I am so thankful to be given that second chance when my neighbor hasn't. And if, if there's only a certain few that are predestined to hear his voice, then why are we called out to go down to my neighbor down the street and tell them about Jesus? If they're going to hell anyway, why am I wasted for that? Why not go witness to the people that are chosen to be saved? That's what I, that's what I want to get about that argument about predestination. I believe that God gives us the opportunities to hear Him. But for whatever reason, He allows some of us to hear His voice and others refuse. I didn't deserve to hear His voice. None of us did. But He let me hear, and I'm forever thankful. I'm forever thankful. But it wasn't a one-time thing. Look at verse 45 in John chapter 6. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. God has patience with me. Infinite patience. You see, at 12 years old when I accepted Christ, I wasn't all of a sudden, oh, this wonderful person, this, this super Christian. But he had patience with me. He nurtured me along. He didn't give up. And I'm sure that a lot of you have that same story. That same relationship with the Lord. And today, I completely trust him. I love him with everything in me. And I hope you do too. I hope you do too. And if there's anyone here that's not sure... I would love to pray with you and invite you to bring Christ into your life. Right up here. See, it's all worthless if I just spout this out and I don't give an opportunity for someone who doesn't know Christ to come forward. If, if you feel this tugging at your heart, you're not sure what's going on, that's what's going on. He's calling to you. It's your second chance. It's your second chance. During this last song, if you have not asked Christ into your life, if you don't know him, or you're not sure if you are saved, please come up here. It's the right time. You know, God's love and God's wrath met each other at the right time. This is the right time for you to say yes and to make it a done deal. I will be up here. I will be up here. This is a safe place to be. Come on up. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for this incredible honor of speaking your truth. God, I pray that during this Thanksgiving time that we don't leapfrog Thanksgiving and go straight to Christmas, that we take time and just sit down and try to begin to understand what you have done for us the chance you have given us again and again to hear your voice. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us, so kind to us, so gracious to us when we were your enemies. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here today that's not sure, not sure if they are on their way to heaven with you, they would come forward during this next song. God, break the barriers that hold them back. Let them come. Let them come. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As the praise band comes forward. <laughs>